Good evening to our candidates running for City Council in Ward 7. And good evening to our audience that's going to be watching this. And I want to thank SPNN, the St. Paul Neighborhood Network cable station in St. Paul, for giving us this opportunity to let the voters understand who they've got to vote for in Ward 7 when Election Day comes on November 7, or early voting is already underway, so you can actually go vote tomorrow uh, and, and choose who you would like to vote for. Unfortunately, we don't have all the candidates here tonight that are running and on the ballot. And I hope you take that into consideration, that these two were thoughtful enough to fill out responses to our questionnaire in advance, and I encourage the voters to go look at the St. Paul uh, Strong, stpaulstrong.com uh, website to look at what the folks have said already to our questions. That's St. Paul, spelled out S-A-I-N-T-P-A-U-L, Dot com, and you can go there to see questionnaire answers from our candidates. For the folks that aren't here, uh, Mr. Guerin did fill out his, uh, Dino Guerin did fill out his questionnaire, but he didn't show. We don't know if he got stuck in traffic, but it's pretty late at night, so I don't think that's what happened. Um, and uh, uh, the other two candidates there's, uh, that aren't here didn't, uh, the other th three that are not here tonight, uh, didn't bother to fill out responses. So. Here's your two good choices to start with for who to vote for on November 7th. Um, my name is Andy Dawkins. I was a state representative in the Frogtown and Rondo neighborhoods for 15 years, and I ran for mayor unsuccessfully in 1993. My co-moderator? Uh, my name is Abu Naeem. I'm a former uh, St. Paul City Council candidate for Ward 1, and I'm currently a board member for the Hamlin Midway Coalition. I want to also introduce St. Paul Strong a little bit. I told you about our website. Uh, we're a group of uh, nonpartisan citizens. We don't make choices in elections. Uh, we just believe that our city government needs to be as transparent and as countable, accountable as it can be. And that's, what we, uh, that's why we're doing this tonight. Uh, we're going to start with uh, the first question, and we'll alternate uh, who, gets, who has to answer first to each question. But you both will get the same question. So uh, sitting in chair one, Ms. Vang, our first question to you is, You've just knocked on my door. You've got 20 seconds to tell me why I should vote for you. Wow, that's uh, pretty amazing. 20 seconds. It should be a five-minute elevator speech, right? Um, my name is Padra Vang, and I'm running for city council in St. Paul, Ward 7. I have been on the east side for 23 years. My family lives here. My dad lives right on Johnson Parkway in 94 in a little high rise. My brother lives on Hazel, and my- 20 seconds. Thank you. All right, Ms. Johnson. Well, hello, my name is Shaniqua Johnson. I'm the DFL and labor endorsed candidate for St. Paul City Council in Ward 7. Uh, one of the things I'll say is the proof is in the pudding. You need a candidate that you're actually gonna rely on to get work done. I've worked at every level of government. When we look at a space to how city council should be working, I wanna work for you and I hope to hear from you about what you wanna see in your next city council member. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Johnson, you go next uh, for the first answer. You're out visiting relatives in rural Minnesota, and your uncle asks you, why do you like living in St. Paul? One of the things that I can say is, you know, as a rural Minnesota native, um, I often have this question, and you look at the space where you look at one thing is for sure. St. Paul is a small town. It's a big city, but it operates, functions, and some of the issues are very similar to that of greater Minnesota. Families want to know that they'll keep their house, and sometimes it's gen generations of St. Paulites that are looking to have that same space. Um, we have local restaurants that are sometimes owned by the mom and pop shops, just like Greater Minnesota. And people just want to know that their voices are heard throughout the state and that you know what it's like to live on the east side. Because road to road, street to street, you might be able to see a wild turkey, you might be able to see a fox, you might even be able to see a kid or two, and that's Greater Minnesota as well. It's literally the Minnesota narrative, um, and I've been able to find my home in both places, and lucky enough to care a lot about my St. Paul community, because again, it's a big city in a small town. Thanks, Ms. Vang. I love St. Paul because of its diversity, because of its sense of community, and it has everything that I need for living. Homes that are affordable, it has wonderful schools, it has a great cultural scene, great shopping and restaurants, great theater and markets and farmers markets, parks, trails. 
I bike every summer, and so I use all the bike trails throughout St. Paul, and uh, it has wonderful dog parks. Everything is close. I work in St. Paul, and I just love the sense of community, the diversity. My family lives here. Thank you. All right, Ms. Fang, uh, starting with you, what is the least favorite thing about living in St. Paul? Oh, least favorite thing? That's a hard one. Hmm. Um, gosh, that is a very hard one. Um, I don't really have a least favorite thing about living in St. Paul because I just love St. Paul. Uh, but uh, one thing that I would want to work for is for to uh, bridge the uh, achievement gap and the income gap and the home ownership gap uh, in St. Paul uh, between uh, whites and people of color. Thank you. Ms. Johnson. Property taxes and potholes. When you're looking at what the experience is, oftentimes, depending on where you are in the city, you could have a different experience maneuvering or even getting to the center of downtown. You know, I, I do also echo the space of my, uh, you know, opponent in saying that I really love my community and I love my town. I love my streets. And at times it's hard to get from point A to point B because it feels like a roller coaster. Mm. Um, and often some places are people are, you know, street to street talking about property taxes, they're talking about rent continuing to go up, and they're talking about the overall affordability to stay here, and that's real. And so for me, you know, I wouldn't say it's necessarily a, a least favorite, but it is something that's worth noting, uh, and I've heard it enough at the doors with our community over and over and over again to know it's a real problem, not only on the east side, but throughout the city of St. Paul. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Yes, sir. So tell me and my co-moderator, Mr. Naeem, something that tells us from your gut about how you think about racism? Hmm. It's crippling. And we have experienced racism for centuries in this country. Um, as a black African-American woman uh, who was a father, uh, you know, who was a, a daughter to a man who was born in a time we were not seeing the same. My father was 96 when he passed. That meant that he lived through racism directly. That meant that he walked the streets and knew what it was like to not have to, uh, to go to the back of a store just to try on shoes in this country, in the United States. That means that he, you know, directly experienced racism uh, and inadvertently continued to throughout his entire life. Um, it's like being followed across the street and uh, just because of the color of my skin, it's crippling. It can sometimes define what your experience is like, what you've lived through, and it happens everywhere, but in particular in the United States. Um, so yeah, you know, I would just simply say racism can be crippling to a lot of people and it sometimes defines how far you get uh, and it's really disgusting, but more importantly, it can be crippling to somebody. You can get trapped in the cycle over and over again uh, in this country. Thank you, Ms. Vang. Thank you. Racism is still alive, it still exists, and I myself feel it almost every day. Racism is institutionalized in our country where we might say to certain individuals, well, if you work hard enough, you can be just success as successful as everyone else. But the truth is that when there's in institutionalized racism, no matter how hard someone works, they can ex still experience barriers based on the color of their skin. And so as a city council member and as a professor myself, I will name racism. And I work, work hard to undo systemic racism that exists in the policies uh, in our city, um, in our country. Um, and I think that we have to be brave, all of us, um, and to examine our um, biases that really translate into this institutionalized ba racism. And so as a city council member, I will definitely be working to undo systemic racism within the policies that are set in our city. Thank you. Starting with uh, Ms. Vang, mm -hmm. uh, tell me and, and Mr. Dawkins uh, something that shows that you deeply understand poverty and inequity. Definitely. Thank you so much. I came here as a refugee. My parents uh, came with just the clothes on their back. Uh, we had to work our way up, and so I grew up in poverty. I grew up saving Ziploc bags, saving yogurt, car yogurt containers, just so, so that we could reuse those. And I still do that today, because it's how I learned how to survive. Knocking on the doors of neighbors on the east side, I see people living in poverty. 
And I know that we can change that by changing our policies, our economic policies, our housing policies, to make it possible for our neighbors to save enough so that they can buy their first home, which is the first way a person can actually build generational wealth is by buying, buying their first home. That's how my parents did it. They saved every penny. Um, and that is how they were able to buy their first home when I was 16. Sometimes you might feel like, you know, when people say, why don't you uh, just work hard enough then you can make it. But we have moms who work three jobs and they still can't make it. And then, then that means that they're not able to be there for their kids' schooling. And then they get blamed for not being there to support their kids' schooling. And so it is a very harmful cycle that our city has the ability to undo. Thank you. Ms. Johnson. So, you know, when you're looking at just the overall stories of where people come from, I think people use this opportunity to usually share something around, like, their personal their personal story is what I say. Um, so I'll bring you back to mine, which starts in Worthington, Minnesota, in a small town of about 10,000 people. I will describe for you that, you know, you walk from the bus stop back home to your uh, small, but, you know, uh, I would say cozy townhome, and you have, walk into the door and you see your mom sitting on the couch crying because your father was displaced due to dementia and you as a family had to make a tough decision to basically remove a vulnerable adult from your home because your home was not um, equipped to handle a elder who has dementia, who has worsening Alzheimer's, who cannot walk up the stairs that he used to, um, who cannot uh, make the food that he used to as a chef and as somebody who worked uh, at a, as a pork, at a pork plant for 33 years in processing, um, but now can't uh, feed themselves. And you have sat side by side to your mom most nights that she looks the same because you are genuinely the sole voice for her between um, being able to actually advocate for your brother who has learning disabilities, for his IEP, for his power of attorney rights, and your father's, and you're 14, and you're told to really try and make a decision between whether or not you'll be able to do an after school program because you're gonna have to be the person to make sure your brother gets to and from school because your mom is gonna be the individual that's going to uh, go and sign his papers to be able to be placed in a nursing home. And you recognize throughout the entire time of this space that advocacy is actually the root of why you are involved in public service and involved in politics. And the reason why you know your family often relies on you and makes those calls even now. And where it's not just around poverty, because poverty, again, is crippling, racism is crippling, but all of those things mean absolutely nothing when you're in a moment of urgency between whether or not you're going to, you know, be able to live with your loved one or not. Whether you go from a two, you know, two-parented household, a family that has made just enough but not enough uh, to qualify for any of the assistance programs, but just enough to live into the low-income housing um, units that are in rural Minnesota, and you're genuinely in a space where you're watching unfold, having to make more budgetary conversations between your next meal, having to decide whether or not you want to play a band instrument because your mom can no longer afford it because your father used to pay for that, and now the care is going to actually go towards his medical assistance. And so you're in a space, again, where you have to make a decision as a young person to keep going, and you do it over and over again. And most individuals in a space where they don't necessarily view themselves as people who are living in poverty or homes, they don't necessarily think of their home as a place that's in poverty. Most of the time, it's a place of survival, and you take pride in it, even if it's really small, even if it's to the broader scheme as in poverty, if it's low income, if it's on the east side, and there's really nothing that maybe the community may see as investing in it, people take pride in it. And so I'd also spin it with, yeah, you, you know, you can understand poverty, you can maybe experience poverty, you can maybe go fo fast forward, but you never actually forget the most moments in which you break. And in community, even in that space, even in that pain, even in that areas of budget, you find hope. And so in the root of it too, you find some of the people that are the most humble and some of the people who actually genuinely want to make their community better because they know what it's like to live with nothing and they hope to be able to utilize the power and the privilege and the spaces that they are now to make sure that people and their community and their neighbors have everything. Thank you. I want to say to both of you that uh, 
uh, the empathy that you demonstrated to the last couple of questions that were asked of you uh, was really admirable. It was sharing the, the way you did about how you see the issues that we think are important to ask questions about. Yeah. Ms. Johnson, so uh, what was the last volunteer activity you engaged in? The last volunteer activity that I engaged in was actually this past week. Um, I am working to genuinely bring together several women of color through my um, organization in Sisterhood We Brunch. And we have been working to try and make sure that our voice is just as you know, prevalent in the professionals field and by helping other organizations do outreach in their community to young people and young professionals of color. And so I've been actively involved in helping just talk to people, um, going to different businesses, different nonprofits um, to help this space for, you know, for nothing. It's really just to talk about opportunities to create access. Um, and we do it quite quite often. Um, but for sure, this past week, we've been able to knock on doors, uh, kind of similar to what you might see as campaigning, but in a space where it's been volunteer led, we've been able to talk about something else for a change, which has been actually pretty nice. Um, and so you get a chance to talk to people about things that they're most passionate about. And a lot of people are, are passionate about opportunities, about jobs, about networking, about where to go to get resources. And if I can do that as a volunteer too, it's kind of nice. Thanks. Uh, Ms. Vang. Thank you. My last volunteer activity spanned 23 years. I co-founded a small civic organization here in the city of St. Paul, where we train women leaders of color, Hmong women leaders of color. The name of the organization is Hmong Women Achieving Together. It was established in 1998. I joined it in 2000, and then we incorporated in 2008. We have a Women's Leadership Institute where we train 12 women each year, and it's been going for the last, gosh, 15 years. Um, and so imagine how many women leaders we have actually you know, sent out in the, into the community. Many of them you may know. Um, they're, they're out there in every, every sector. Uh, of every sector of our community uh, doing great leadership work and that's something that I'm passionate about and that's why I became a professor so I could mentor students who have a vision for themselves but who just needed somebody to help them you know as a person of color being new uh, to many parts of our society such as uh, you know working in the Western world you know or going to an American educational institution um, I worked really hard to to establish myself to learn you know when I was younger in my 20s I was really a learner and so I had some great mentors who taught me many skills how to lead an organization open an organization how to do budgets uh, and so that I wanted to pass that on and so we started our leadership institute in 2008 we hired a uh, teacher a, a facilitator um, and it's been very successful, and so that, that is my passion, and I hope to uh, continue to work to support our youth uh, who have a dream and a vision for themselves. Thank you. Right, this uh, question, uh, starting from Ms. Fang, uh, who has been a role model for you? Mm, a role model, that's a really, really wonderful. Uh, that's a really wonderful question. You know, a really great role model for me was, uh, you know, when I first moved here to the Twin Cities, I uh, was a graduate student, you know, I uh, was by myself, my family hadn't moved here yet, and I reached out to, her name is Dr. Mai Kao Hong. She was just a couple of years older than me, but she was really uh, just a go-getter, super successful in her field, she was working uh, at public housing agency at the time. Um, she was leading uh, New Chia Mamun, Women Achieving Together, which was actually an action team out of, out of Ramsey County at the time. Um, and she was just a great leader, um, was able to uh, just uh, be, be everything that, that I wanted to be. And now she's the founding dean at um, St. Thomas University, so. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Yeah, I've been blessed to have quite a few different role models in my uh, lifetime. And I think about that, I just am like, it's truly been something that has evolved over time. But when I started at the University of Minnesota in 2013 and moved to the Twin Cities and didn't know um, really anyone, um, especially not in the political sphere, I didn't know, I hadn't been taught about 
uh, Paul Wellstone, Hubert Humphrey, Roy Wilkins, um, Dr. Josie Johnson, Dr. Samuel Myers. Uh, I met them along, you know, met Dr. Myers along the way in the journey as a research assistant at the Humphrey School. And I feel like if it hadn't have been for Dr. Myers um, and his attention to detail, his uh, curious mind, uh, not only just in how to make the world better, but also just in how to make sure that we were communicating to the broader public about issues that were really important to us, but doing it in a way that wouldn't lose people along the way. Uh, for me, he has definitely been a role model. Um, when I was a congressional staffer for Keith Ellison, I was able to be front hand in the federal government seeing just how a grassroots organizer could be a public defender turned into a congressperson now sitting at the, as the Attorney General of Minnesota and being able to be alongside him in that journey as his staffer in education and youth outreach where I was able to pretty much connect such a big figure in Congress to kids at our local public schools and spaces where people weren't often have an opportunity to talk to their elected leader. You know, I think probably if not for Dr. Myers and Keith, I don't think I'd be sitting here um, really thinking about what it means to have more young people involved in public government and in politics and in public service and to be able to get in and ask the inquisitive questions to challenge people who may often bring up the fact that they're older than you and that somehow means that they have more experience and yet they've never actually worked directly in government. So it's hard to see the direct ties even though they may be older than you. Um, it's in that space where I think sometimes like, you know, it was those two leaders a, along with my mom, who, you know, I've already mentioned her uh, life story really stems from being a young woman over time, having to grow up much, much faster than the average person. And that kind of has echoed through my journey, too. Um, you know, I've been working ever since I was 14, and it wasn't in politics, that's for sure. Um, but it is in a space where I'm like, I've never had an opportunity to be just my age. Um, you know, I'm 28, and I'm pretty thankful to be sitting here, you know, alongside people who have maybe experienced more life than me, but don't have the same experience that I bring to the table. And I look forward to being able to showcasing that. And I've seen that embodied through people who have started this journey sometimes at 20. I think about all of the leaders that have been involved in politics over time, especially in the United States, that were under the age of 40. And I get encouraged, so. Thank you. Yeah. So. Um First to you, Ms. Johnson, how are you advantaging ranked choice voting in this Ward 7 election? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that is really important for me and, and probably for anybody who's thinking about participating in a ranked choice, a lot of times community members still have to get to a place of understanding about what ranked choice voting is. So I think a huge advantage for me at the doors is often talking about ranked choice. I can't assume that they per that a person on uh, you know at every door under fully understands what to do. So they get to the ballot box, and while I understand like there are six different boxes, what do I do? There's different names, you know. I've been able to explain and really just have a, a different conversation with voters. So you know, for me, I've definitely taken the time to just talk about the voting process. I'm not just banking on the fact that they will remember my name, although you know Shaniqua Johnson uh, is memorable, I would hope that they'd actually go to the ballot box and know what to do with it. So I'm talking a lot about the process. And in addition, just because somebody has a lawn sign that isn't mine doesn't mean I won't be able to talk to them. So I've been door knocking intentionally in spaces where people have a lawn sign, don't have a lawn sign, everyone can participate in ranked choice because we do have choices. And maybe I'm not the first choice, but hey, I could be your second. And maybe I'm not your second, but hey, I could be your third. It really doesn't give you an opportunity to find a way out of talking to somebody. So I've taken it. Thank you, Ms. Vang. Thank you. I really love ranked choice voting, and we talk about that every single time we knock on the door of a resident. Um, the beauty about ranked choice voting is that candidates can actually run together uh, and uh, really lift each other up. Um, and I tell uh, voters that they can vote for everyone. They can vote for all candidates. Mm. They can rank all, they can vote, they get to vote for everyone. Um, they just rank them. Uh, based on qualifications, based on how much they like the person, based on how many times they knocked on their door. You know, all these different factors that voters are making decisions on. Um, and uh, I, one thing that I um, 
tell uh, voters is um, that uh, I think ranked choice voting is new to a lot of people. And so I provide a lot of education. You know, I actually have a little drawing, a little pictograph, you know, that I show them this is what it looks like, you know, and then you can, you know, the left-hand column is the first choice, you know, all the way down to uh, your last choice. Um, but I think the great thing is that, what, another thing is that it allows candidates to actually talk to each other and to say, you know, um, if you, your supporters, if you could ask your supporters to, to uh, list me second. Uh, and if you just read the latest article in the Pioneer Press, Dean O'Garen is telling his voters to uh, list him first and me second. And I think that just shows collaboration, you know, um, t uh, an ability to work together when candidates can actually do that. Thanks. So to the viewers out there, so we have six candidates running for Ward 7. Uh, there's a decent possibility that no one is going to get 50% of the votes. And the other five are going to share the 49%, okay? So there'll be no winner on the first count through. And you're going to, and if you voted for the last place finisher, who is then dropped off, maybe Dino, maybe somebody else, whoever drops off, it's not that your vote doesn't count anymore. You'll get to look at the, the election judges will get to look at who your second choice was. And it could be one of these two. Uh, and so it's important for the candidates to say, you know what, even if you got someone else in mind for your first choice, I'd love to be your second choice. And it's important for the candidates to go out there and say, you know, I'm not talking bad or down about anybody else um, because we're all here and here's why I would like you to be first. And if I'm not first, I'd love to be your second. So I just wanted the viewers to understand what the two of you were explaining, that it's an important part of this election. All right. Uh, Starting with uh, Ms. Vang, is your neighborhood safe and what makes a safe neighborhood? Mm, that's a great, you know, yeah, so that, I mean, just uh, the immediate reaction to that question is that, uh, you know, we think about is there a crime, right? Is there violent crime in my neighborhood? I live right on Payne Avenue uh, by the music, Minnesota Music Cafe and, um, and the fire station there. Um, you know, I would have to say that I feel safe in my neighborhood. I, I often take walks with my dog and I leave my door unlocked uh, because I feel safe. Uh, so safety is actually, uh, you know, an individual definition, but if we just want to uh, go to that immediate reaction, um, unfortunately in my neighborhood, there has been a lot of, we hear a lot of uh, gunfire. Uh, there was a shooting across right at the corner of my home about uh, two years ago in the winter. Um, there was another shooting down on Payne about a year and a half ago, both individuals um, uh, did not make it. Um, uh, you know, there's a lot of sirens um, and so forth. Um, and so I think when you hear about statistics, statistics like that, people would say that my neighborhood is not safe. Um, uh, and you said your last question was, well, what's the so second what would you, what you do about it? Yes, absolutely. You know, I think that in the latest article in the Pioneer Press talked about, um, you know, the police department um, staffing, bringing the police force back up to um, uh, its uh, being fully staffed, right? Um, but that's not the only answer, right? I think that a lot of people in Ward 7, uh, they talk about uh, wanting more police presence in the sense that they want to have a relationship with the police, right? And the police, uh, St. Paul Police has worked really hard to do that with their summer events, neighborhood events, um, hiring two community liaisons uh, who go out into the community. Um, I would love to work with our district councils in Ward 7 to uh, you know, provide more funding and staffing and programming to do neighborhood outreach. You know, as a city council member, I would encourage neighbors to do national night out so that they can build relationships with their neighbors. Also empower neighbors to do um, neighborhood watch programs. Um, and also have our, our um, you know, we have our homeless assistance resource team. Neighbors talk about how they don't feel safe when there are un individuals who are unhoused, right, encampments. Um, you know, I walk in Sweet Hollow al almost every day. Um, I, I personally don't feel unsafe, but I think that there is that perception. Uh, so I think that if we can have more city staff providing more services to our unhoused, you know, folks uh, dealing with mental health concerns, um, uh, and uh, the St. Paul Police Department has already uh, 
hired a social worker to help screen phone calls where, you know, if, if a police officer is not ne necessary for the phone call, a social worker or some other person could actually respond to that call and work with that family or that individual to ensure that they're getting the needs, the needs that they're asking for. Uh, so I think it is, it requires many, many different fronts, right? Many different um, uh, areas or components in order to ensure that there's safety in our community. Um, I think first and foremost, I would love for neighbors to build relationships with each other. You know, I live in the Sweet Hollow Brownstones. We have uh, monthly meetings and we also have every Thursday um, uh, gatherings in the evenings just so that we can get to know each other. We have a little website where we share our phone numbers and emails, and we email each other. We have a little Facebook page. If we're up or someone's gonna be out of town, they say, well, you know, can you watch my home? Um, if a, someone's garage door is open, we call each other and say, your garage door is open, would you like me to close it? And so forth, and so I think that that's, that's what, what I would like to get to is where neighbors have relationships with each other. Thank you, Ms. Jansen. So, you know, I would say, I was thinking about this, I'm like, oh, but I consider my neighborhood safe. Um, I'm going to say no, and I'm also going to say that, you know, personally for me, as somebody who lives by themselves, and that was a factor in my, you know, just decision in general to what kind of neighborhood, what space that I wanted to stay in, and all of the things came into place, and you know that over the course of the last few weeks, we've been in, you know, east side, and in particular Dayton's Bluff, and even just north of, uh, north of the target on, in Battle Creek has been in the news several times for gun violence, and it's a true issue. It's a real issue, um, and it's impacting a lot of people in community. The, it's a common thing in our community to sometimes hear gunshots at all, all times of the day, sometimes in midday, and a lot of Eastsiders have had direct trauma or traumatic experiences due to um, feeling unsafe. So that's why public safety is my, uh, public safety and housing, but mostly public safety is a pretty top issue for me. Um, you know, while I have a chance to just simply also address our community and our east side, you know, I'm proud to say that I'm not a defund the police candidate. I am an individual that really does believe that we need a fully staffed police department. I'm an individual that believes we need to have a fully staffed uh, fire department. I'm proud to be endorsed by the firefighters. And, you know, while I did read um, the article that talks about uh, uh, Mr. Guerin supporters, you know, I'm gonna go on a leash here and say, as we look and we work towards uh, policing and public safety in our community, I proudly served on the ex police chief examining committee at the city of St. Paul because I know that the east side needs to have a voice in public safety because the things that we are experiencing may not always be, be echoed throughout the city of St. Paul. Um, you know, when I hear and meet with the firefighters and they talk about the CARES program that was implemented from the city and we learned that they have hired uh, one social worker that lasted for a day and that that position has been really challenging to fill within that program. We think about how we've made some efforts and strides at the city level to implement community first public safety programs. But maybe it's a time, uh, you know, with the new council as well so as if elected to evaluate how those programs are doing since we're investing a lot of resources into them. You know, I've heard from community members talk about traffic safety and control. When you also talk to the St. Paul Police Department, you learn that there isn't a unit for that. And people talk about speeding. People talk about not being able to safely get across Minnehaha, across White Bear, across 61, across the uh, Burns, in places where the city council really does have an active role in trying to make sure we have up-to-date uh, pedestrian crosswalks, we have adequate stop signs, that the places that are currently seeing a lot of construction on our roads that city council can actually control, that city, ca city council can actually do something in four years, let's talk about speed bumps. Let's talk about updated east side infrastructure. You know, you hear that in Mounds Park, you hear, just like you hear that in Dean's Bluff, you hear it in Battle Creek, and you hear it in Highwood, and you hear it in Eastview, and Sweet Hollow, and several places that people are truly concerned about their safety. When I think about the city council, the thing I would like to see more of um, and that I plan to really bring to the table, it isn't just about, you know, just the relationships that individuals have because we know our police department, we know our firefighters, we know the individuals and a lot of them actually live in St. Paul. On the east side, I was just out knocking today with Roberto, who's a Ward 7 uh, firefighter. We know him. We know who he is. We have that relationship. The problem is he's responding to the same amount of calls, if not more, 
as his counterparts were in the 70s because we haven't added a full-time firefighter. And so, you know, if you're supporting the police department, if you're supporting the firefighters, I'm probably actually your candidate in that space to talk a little bit about public safety because I do know a thing or two about bridging gaps and bringing people together across many political spectrums. But most importantly, when it comes to public safety, we've got four years to make a dent in what we're currently seeing. And what we're currently seeing is we can have a situation where three minors are shot and it make headlines, news maybe one time, and we move on like it's normal. It's not normal. And people are feeling that in our rec centers, in our libraries, in our public schools. And I'm proud to be endorsed by the teachers union and to have the educators support in my ward. It's going to take a huge village on the east side, but throughout the city to stop normalizing crime. It's not normal to walk outside in the dark because a Cadillac, con uh, a Cadillac converter or a, or a copper wire is stolen from a street light. That's not normal. That's still a crime. It's still illegal. And it's still dangerous for the bystander. For the individual who lives there every single day, it is still reality that we're filling on the east side. And that's something that for me, I'm trying to address. All right, uh, Ms. Johnson, starting with you. Uh, what actions have you taken personally to curb gun violence and what will you do once elected? Yeah, when you're thinking about you know gun violence for me, I am someone who actively has been continuing and will continue to talk to young people. I don't say that it's just young people doing, you know, participating or experiencing gun violence. But for me, a lot of what the trajectory of the next few decades are going to look like starts and stems from young people. There's a lot of people who haven't spent a lot of time in schools. I am actively working to make sure that our campaign, our team, um, but beyond that, my profession also reflects that um, in making sure that I have a pulse on what's happening in our schools, in our libraries, um, in our health organizations. During the day, I am a program officer at the St. Paul Minnesota Foundation. I oversee the health grant making portfolio and work with nonprofits throughout the city um, and on the east side of St. Paul, making sure that they have resources to actually do what I think is preventative towards things like gun violence. Um, but when you're thinking about the city and just how it relates to overall the issues, um, you know, it is advocating at the state level for stricter uh, stricter protections. It's making sure that we're pushing through things around how to conceal, how to carry, how to push through actual education for our city and our civilians on how to properly utilize and protect and conceal your weapon. It's also in a space where when you're looking through young people, if we are able to invest in the programs that are needed, the um, investing in their schools and investing in their rec centers and their after school programming. If we are able to provide something for them to do after hours, they're less likely to get involved in the things that they are seeing, which is gun violence, and more likely to get involved in things that could actually help curve our, um, you know, our intentional heightened spike in in our community and our unsafe areas. So, you know, for me, it is about starting with young people. I'm actively still involved in my communities. Um, you know, I'm actively still involved in school. I'm actively listening to young people talk about their direct experiences because we can't lose sight of what people are experiencing today if we're gonna, or if we're gonna tackle major things like gun violence and gun issues. Ms. Vang. Thank you so much. This is a topic that is often discussed when knocking on doors. Um, neighbors are concerned about gun violence. Um, and so I do, uh, I, my, my, personally, I talked to, to people about this. Um, that is the action that I've taken, is around um, ensuring that if, if people do own guns, that they, their guns are locked up and kept safe. I myself do not own a, a gun, and nor do any member of my family or friends. And so um, endorsing the, the value around, you know, we don't, we, I myself uh, don't necessarily need to own a gun. But if individuals uh, wish to own a gun, I would encourage them to keep them locked up and safe for, uh, away from kids. Thank you. Ward 7 is the home to the Dayton's Bluff Local Historic District, which has preserved not only stately Victorian homes, but much workforce housing from the 19th century. The mayor and the current city council have demonstrated very little support for St. Paul's historic resources demonstrated by their desire to demolish the Justice Ramsey House, the Hamlin Midway Library, and to build a raised bikeway on the famed Summit Avenue Historic Boulevard. Do you support the restoration and redevelopment of historic resources in St. Paul, such as the Hams Brewery in Ward 7? No, I think Ms. Banks first. <laughs> 
Oh, am I? Okay. The Hands Brewery. Okay, thank you so much. I was thinking, um, I think that's already been contracted, uh, I believe. Um, yes, absolutely. I think that uh, what makes St. Paul beautiful and any city beautiful is um, its, its historical uh, sites and buildings. Um, th these are the things that attract people to, to the city of St. Paul, uh, tourists and so forth, uh, which would actually bring in um, revenue to, to the city of St. Paul. Um, on top of that, let's see, I'm trying to take notes here as you were talking. Um, I'm so sorry. Um, no, just <laughs> slow you, down. Do, you, yeah. do you like the current city councils not being very supportive of preserving historic, uh, you know, preservation? Or, or you think they're doing a great job at it? Well, I'm always in support of restoration and uh, preservation of historic sites. Uh, I think the issue that the city council has with it is uh, how the funding of that, right? I would like, I'm always talking about partnering with private and nonprofit industries, um, entities that uh, are in support of this. Um, I, always, I also would like to uh, branch out or expand what, what we mean by historic preservation. And that, all, and that goes back to, um, uh, native sites as well as newer communities. Um, uh, and so, yes, I am in support of it, but I would like to look more at what funding might look like. Thank you. Ms. Johnson. Can you repeat the, can you repeat the original question, please? Oh, yeah. Uh, it's a long one, and it was submitted by um, someone who cares a lot about historic <laughs> preservation and would like to know how you feel about it. And so I won't read the whole thing very. Okay. Uh, well, if it's just a synopsis of it, I can. Yeah, I, yeah, no, yeah. we just want to know you support the restoration and redevelopment of historic resources in St. Paul, such as the Hams Brewery. Yes, I do. And you know, one of the things that I think is just important to know, um, I was the only candidate that showed up to the historic preservation forum uh, from Ward 7. And when you're thinking about just being able to take the time to invest in things, I think showing up is a big part. And I would argue that, you know, one of the things I'm hoping to see uh, in the Hamburys redevelopment is some intentional community showing up and talking about exactly what we want to see there. Because much as any development, it should reflect the community, it should be within the community, it should be organized with the community, it should be contracted with the community. And I hope to see that work with uh, JB Vang in the near future and look forward to being a, a huge supportive partner uh, when it comes to what we can do to build actual affordable housing there, to make it multi-purpose, to see if it could benefit businesses locally as well so as just making sure that the east side has development that we can look at and say, hey, this is something that the community built. and. You know, so in that question, you know, yes, historic preservation is a priority for me. I think how we tell our story in the future leads to centuries, uh, if not, of people really learning from what we've learned. And then also when it comes to that redevelopment in particular, uh, I'm really excited about it. And I hope to continue to work with the developers on it and have it reflect community. Thank you. Next question is um, one that is kind of designed to um, run out of time, too. And it's a long question. So I'm going to. Um, just uh, prelude it with this. In terms of the city's budget and finances, um, we use TIF, tax increment financing. Um, and um, I'm hoping that the two of you uh, would, either one of you got elected, would have a basic understanding of what TIF it is, what TIF is, and what it's, um, you know, what are the pros and cons of using it as a financial tool? So I think that uh, the first person to answer this time is you, Ms. Johnson. Just so if we understand it. Understand it, and what are the pros and cons? Yeah, you know, I think the one thing that I would argue overall, right, the affordable housing in St. Paul, we need to basically cater to the tax base. TIF dollars would, you know, often are supposed to be used on rare occasions when the, you know, construction cannot move forward or things cannot move forward, if not for TIF resources. Um, you've seen that kind of be flexible over time, um, in my opinion, personally, but I also want to see a space where when we're talking about development, when we're talking about continuing forward, that if we're utilizing TIF dollars, it's because the, you know, this is the last resort not the first resort, because at the end of the day, at the city, we've got to expand the tax base. And so, you know, bare minimum or understanding or f fundamental understanding of TIF, 
I would say yes. And I'd also say as we move forward, you know, one of the things that I really want to see um, continue with our projects and our development and the things that we have to build here in the city is that some things cater to the tax base and that we're actually be, are able to talk about that as a real need. Um, but also, you know, share sharing the, the benefits of TIF with all of the east side as well and all of the city of St. Paul. So each individual uh, area or neighborhood can have equal access because it does seem to see it does seem to me that maybe on the east side we haven't had as much resources when it comes to TIF um, related to some of our projects even in cases where it might have been beneficial. Thank you. Ms. Vang. Thank you very much. Um, you know TIF is used in areas uh, that are blighted or that would not be developed without uh, city assistance. It would offer a 20-year exemption from um, taxation uh, once the property is developed, of course, the, the taxes on that property would be increased and the uh, developer would then be exempt from paying that for the next 20 years. The benefit of that is that th those dollars would go to um, supplement, for example, at Highbridge, uh, you know, the 20-year TIF would actually go to, to supplement affordable housing units, 30% um, AMI uh, through co provided through common bond and PPL. Uh, and also pu public park spaces. Um, and so, so that is the goal. Uh, I do agree that um, I would like to see TIF being used at, you know, in projects such as Hillcrest. Um, and so um, I, I do support that only if those dollars are being put back into the community and supporting um, our neighbors uh, so that they can actually get into um, decent housing, um, affordable housing units, and supporting sp public spaces, um, uh, such as parks, trails, and so forth. Thank you. So we're getting near uh, the end of our hour. Uh, we're going to start with the closes in just a few seconds. And Ms. Johnson, you're going to go first with your one-minute closing statement. But I want to tell our viewers again that uh, there's so many questions we haven't had a chance to ask because the time went by uh, so swiftly here. Uh, how do these candidates uh, feel about uh, the Summit Avenue bikeway? How do they feel about the one cent sales tax that we're going to be voting on? Are they going to be voting yes or no? Um, what do they think about the uh, Rebecca Necker proposal to uh, have on uh, a child care subsidy so that more families get child care? Uh, there's so many other questions that I refer you to the answers that were given in our questionnaire and encourage you to educate yourselves as much as possible about your candidates, these two wonderful ones for sure, uh, as you go to the polls on November 7 or choose to vote early to do that. So now uh, we're going to move to the closing statements, and that will conclude the hour. Ms. Johnson. Well, you know, thank you so much for just taking the time this evening just to one, put this on. And I'll also just simply say to all the folks that are watching this, thank you so much for tuning in and really trying to learn more about the candidates um, in a way that I feel like is really important. Because again, to me, local government is supposed to be the closest to the people. Um, and I think when we're looking at city council and when we're thinking about who we want to see in our next city council member, who we want to see leading our city moving forward, I really do feel like on November 7th and or before if you're an early voter, uh, it's really important for you to kind of decide who you want to see leading and not just the person that you like the most, not to the per just the person that makes you laugh, but the person who actually has more experience in the job and who knows a thing or two about city government and knows what they're signing up for. For me personally, I feel like, again, uh, the proof is in the pudding. I feel like you can take a risk on someone new and or you can take a risk on somebody who has actually had um, a lot of time talking about elected office, about governance, about politics, about what our city needs moving into the east side Thank as you. well. One minute, Ms. Vang. Thank you so much. I've been on the east side for 23 years. Like I said before, my family lives here. You know, I actually bring the whole package. I have 23 years of experience doing this work, first as a social worker, working directly with neighbors, families, on all the issues that we just talked about. Um, and, and then I teach social policy in a social work program at St. Catherine University where I teach municipal government, city government, and taxation and policies and programs and ordinances and really thinking about the unintended consequences of policies and, how, and the effects on families. And then I've also practiced policy, right? I did a tax study with the city of St. Paul. I do state level policy right now with a, as a chair of the Minnesota Water Social Work. 
Um, and I um, helped Beth Commerce write the uh, fair housing statement uh, in last spring. Um, and so, you know, I do have the years, the years of experience to use to do this. I would be able to dive right in and do this job. And I have the support of our current city council member, Jane Prince, because she believes that I have the years of experience and maturity to do this job. Thank you. That concludes this discussion for the election in Ward 7. Good evening, everyone. Thank you.